to the podcast where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. We are rolling, rocking and rolling. It's 1030 here at the Wonderful, what hotel are we in? Yes, we're in Mandalay Bay in yes. the Expo Center here. I'm here with Stephanie Mandeli. She is the SVP of People, Talent, DE, and I at Employ. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Stephanie is from Boston, but she was just professing her love of Long Island, so we had to dig into that for a little bit. Are you a Red Sox fan? Uh, I'm not a sports fan in general. All right, so we're going to keep that conversation. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that one rolling. So let's, let's, let's first talk about Employ. Tell us yeah. what Employ does. Yeah, so Employ is a suite of recruitment technologies. We have three ATS platforms and RPO, Jazz HR, Lever, and Jobvite, and next thing RPO. And then we have a, a suite of products that overlay to, to support and, and augment the, the recruitment journey. And your specific role, you're managing people within the organization. Yeah, yeah. So I am the head of HR. What is it like? to be the head of HR within the HR tech people company. Is it like an, another layer of pressure? Is it, oh, is it always, Everyone you have to be- Everyone asks me that. Everybody asks me that. No, I love it. I have to say, this is my favorite job that I've ever had and I've had some cool jobs, but I think there's this really incredible opportunity for me to impact our product. My practice, my the thing that I love, which is human resources, is the thing that we sell basically mm -hmm. in different lenses of it. But I get to participate in product conversations. I get to participate in acquisition conversations. But similarly, on the opposite side, my product and engineering teams are constantly keeping me up to date on what's happening in the industry and making sure that we're staying best in class up to date as much as humanly possible. It's almost like you have to be. You don't want to be the plumber with the broken toilet. I know. Like well, that, that's huge. And how large is the organization? We have about 600 employees, yeah. What has been your biggest challenge to date from an organizational standpoint when it comes to the tech and the people and making sure that you're not over-teching the people side of it? So That's a long way of saying. Great I'm question. So transparently, we are a recruitment technology company, and so we do leverage our own tools and resources. But I would say I am a firm believer in stripping it down. I My background is in HR transformation, and so I enter organizations where mm -hmm. there's a time and an opportunity to um, level up. Improve. Exactly. Yes. And for me, coming into the organization, there's a, a nice long assessment period, but taking a look at everything that we offer, everything that we leverage and making sure that we're even using our own products in the right way. So the, my best advice to everybody is just strip it down, really evaluate what you need and what does the success criteria look like on an implementation or utilization. So I wanna make a left turn and go down a rabbit hole. You said Great. something interesting about assessment and, and I'm an in the trenches recruiter yeah. and I'm always coaching candidates through the process. And I always tell them, you're interviewing the company as much as they interview. And one question I always say, once you get a little bit further on the process, Two questions. One, what does success look like in this role 30, 60, 90 days? Because that'll tell you, am I being thrown into the fire? Yeah. Or if I'm going to have time to onboard and ramp up? And it's a tricky question, too, because you don't want to be an interview. You don't want to seem like you're not a go-getter. But at right. the same time, how would you coach a candidate to ask a company, hey, am I going to have time to do an assessment and to onboard properly? Yeah. What, what's the right way to... What's the right way to ask that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. For me, I think I think the way that you've articulated it is the way that I often articulate it, which is what is that sort of 30, 60, 90 expectation? I think the other piece that I would say to a candidate is what, just frankly, what is the success criteria? I think that's a perfectly acceptable thing mm -hmm. to be asking the business. Other ways that I like to triangulate that answer, what is the thing that's keeping you up at night? What's the most critical thing that has to be solved for in the next six months? Question. And then my personal favorite question, why would somebody not want to take this job? Ooh. I love when candidates really? ask me that. Oh my gosh, I love it because- You're asking for a candid, honest answer. Yes, I am. Why would somebody not take this job? Let's clip this one up. Yeah. So why do you like to answer that? So, wow. because I think it creates transparency. Mm -hmm. I think HR often gets a bad rap for being sort corporate of Corporate cops. Yeah, corporate cops. There's this old school caricature mm -hmm. of what we are. and. I think that's antiquated and maybe it exists in some pockets, but not in the pockets that I'm sorry, <laughs> not in the pockets not in your that, pocket. I, that I work in, but I think it opens up a level of transparency between the candidate and the company. And I think everybody goes into it with eyes wide open because as much as we say the reality of the position, I do believe that candidates sometimes 
hear what they want to hear. And so I think this is a, it's a good opportunity to have a very transparent, open conversation. So let's go back to the other side of the house. I want to get back to the, the internal side. I want to talk about aligning HR with business goals. And my favorite role that has come out, I don't know if I'm, you fact check on this one, I'll quote the last 10, 15 yeah. years, is the rise of the HR VP, the HR yeah. business partner. And I think partner is a key word out there. What's your philosophy on that type of role and practice and need for it within an organization? That's where I'm probably most passionate uh, when I think about HR. I think the role of an HR business partner, it's so funny because that role has evolved even in the last 10 years. Um, I like to call it the like the superhero behind the scenes. There's Love the ones that, that are connecting too, yeah. all of the pieces. It makes it happen. A hundred percent. And so for me, I do have a team of HR business partners. They are aligned by client group. They are embedded in the business that they serve. What's the typical background for anyone out there? What's the typical background of a good HR VP? Where are they coming from? What's your discipline? I think everybody has a different opinion. I, I actually have built a team that has different backgrounds. It's so more like finance heavy backgrounds, it's HR backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've even hired recruiters into the, the opportunity because I, would I think- I'd love to be in that type of role. I know. Like if I was ever to go back to corporate world, yeah. Yeah, there's something so incredible about like a recruiter's consulting skills. When done, bam, that's what I need. I need a business partner who knows how to ask the tough questions of the business leaders that they're working with and then make a solution for that. Such an interesting point you bring in because recruiters, first and foremost have their ear to the ground in every aspect of the organization. They, do. they understand the market, what the good, bad, and ugly of candidates are saying about a company. Hey, guess what, people? The, the market doesn't like our company. Nobody wants to work here. Why do you think hiring is so hard? But be able to frame that in a constructive way. And then we talk about the numbers side of the house. Yeah. Understanding and setting, helping set salary bands and understanding if we're above market, under market, yeah. and also for that particular position in an organization, where's there potential wiggle room too? Yeah, I love that you say that because I think I often talk about things like comp as a, an art and a science, but yes. there isn't every single job, we don't have a perfectly mapped market, right? And so that's where my recruiters come in. What are they hearing? What are the mm. candidates saying? When you talk to enough people, you can validate your data pretty quickly. So I love you saying that. The toughest part for me as a recruiter is the, the, the hardest and easiest part for me is the money conversation. Yeah. I always have it in the first call because you have to manage expectations. To. And it's a tough one because when I have to tell somebody that they're above above the salary range, I'm like, it's. I'm not telling you to go. It's, I know you're looking for 150, but this is only 100. I'm not telling you to accept this. Yeah. I'm just telling you what this company's bandwidth is. Yeah. That's what they're saying for this manager level role. That's what it is. It's a tough one because you don't want to lose a good candidate. At the same yeah. time, I tell every candidate, this is your moment to take a shot. Because really, you're really only making raises when you change up. Let's be real about it. Oh, 100. Like, where the meaningful money happens, yeah. That's where the meaningful money happens. So when you pull back the curtain, what, what is it like in an organization when you have that player, like that candidate, and you're like, oh, how do we, we get a couple extra bucks here? Or is it going to really throw off the parity, the pay parity within an organization? That's an imperfect answer, I would say. I think I've done in my career, I've done any number of the things that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, I believe in a total rewards opportunity. And maybe I, I was just approving before I popped in here, us going a bit higher in a band because the candidate is the right candidate mm -hmm. for the opportunity. But I like to look at it as total rewards. What are we offering from an equity perspective? What are we offering from a, a bonusing perspective? What are our what are our sign on opportunities as well? And yeah, where there are the levers? Exactly. Where are the other levers that you can pull? And I think that's another place where recruiters have this incredible opportunity to build that relationship with candidate and get that depth of honesty, so that we have somebody coming in understanding. The podcast would like to thank Higher Road for supporting this series of episodes recorded live at HR Tech in Las Vegas this September. Higher Road is a leading global provider of HR software driven by People Insight, our best-in-class people analytics solution. People Insight by Higher Road delivers implementation in under one week. It's a suite of intuitive dashboard visualizations to make sense of your disparate HR data and a team of analysts to support you every step of the way. They provide a transparent, cost-effective approach to meet companies where they are at in their people and data journey. And for more info, please visit higherroad.com forward slash pause, P-O-Z. Thanks. Well, let's move on and talking about process. And I think this is if you spend two minutes on LinkedIn or Glassdoor, you're hearing the bad stuff, you're hearing about terrible processes. Yeah. And I just had this conversation with Lydia Wu right before you. It doesn't mean that the people, if the process sucks with an organization, it doesn't mean that the people suck. That's right. And there's a lot of things out there. I think it's a bit of an urban legend, but a myth, like a misnomer that if a company's hiring process is bad, that the company's bad. Yeah, and I was like, there's a lot of factors that you have to, there's 
scheduling, there's market, there's timing, there's seasonality. But generally speaking, you talk about transformation. What are some of these best practices that companies need to do better when it comes to process? 100% communication. 100% communication. And we can talk all day long about how recruitment teams are lean and they're and it's Overwhelmed, hard. pipelines too big. This was a problem when our TA was bloated a couple right. of years ago, right? So it's always been a, a problem. I think, I think communication is the piece. We don't spend enough time talking about how simple check-ins in the process is going. Um, prepping for an interview. A non-update update is an update. A non-update is an update. I say every Friday, recruiters, every Friday, touch base with your open candidates, even if it's like, hey, I know it's the end of the week. Yeah. A couple of people are out of town. I hope to have it by Monday. That's, That's all you want to hear. Just yes. want to be reassured that you're still in the process. That's that right. They care. That's right. Mm. And then I too, I, I also believe, and this is going to be a little bit liberal, but I believe that I believe that if somebody is not the right fit for an opportunity, but you have some actionable feedback for them for why they're not a fit for this opportunity, give it to them. Let's pause on that one for a second because this is it's a liberal approach, but do you think that in this litigious society we're opening up too many cans of worms? I'm not asking. I would never ask a recruiter to give somebody feedback that would be in that space. But I'll give you an example. I had interviewed for a head of HR role a while back within the portfolio company that I work for. And I didn't do a good job articulating my scaling experience. And so that was a really good thing. That's an actionable feedback. It's not like actionable. we don't like you. Yes, but I certainly <laughs> hope that hiring managers are not too liberal with the we don't like you feedback. Let's be honest here. Generally speaking, yeah. No client in particular. I have received. I'm sure you have in your career too. Yeah, where like course. you have this hard manager, so can like we just didn't, we just didn't like them or I know the worst one is for me. I hate the F word. I've spoken about it, and the F word yeah. for me is fit. I okay. hate culture oh, I fit. Hate fit. I hate fit that. means that you're looking for everyone to look and feel the same. Exactly. And I it's agree. When it shouldn't be. Yeah. And I, and I'm like I'm gonna push back on the hiring manager. What do you mean? Does that mean that they're not thinking like you? Yes. They don't act like you, and they don't yes. talk or look like you. Yes. How do you can back as up? a lead? go back to the team with actionable. How do you make it a learning opportunity? I love that. So for us, just to close out the communication piece too, yes. I would just say, make sure that you're partnering with vendors that make communication easy for you. There's integrations with texting, there's scheduled texting. Find ways to make your job easier from a comms perspective. There are vendors out there, we're one, but there are vendors out there that can support you with some automation and communication. But in, in res with respect to the feedback loop with the hiring managers, I, I we do scorecarding, so we have pretty in-depth intake processes. We do candidate personas for all of our roles. I love that. So you're having some standards. Yes, some standards. Yeah. So we have a job description. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a job description, but then there's a candidate persona. What is the right persona for this opportunity? And it's all based on experiences, not personality traits. So this person needs to have experience scaling from X to Y. This mm -hmm. person needs to work in a matrixed organization. Um, and so then my recruiters are able to suss that out as part of their behavioral based interviewing process. We send scorecards to the hiring teams that are uh, based on the candidate persona and the job description articulated. Right, so they're able to match back a score to a, and a so specific. And so they're able to match it back. And my recruiters are absolutely empowered and trained and expected to go back to the business and say, tell me why this person isn't a fit for this job or isn't the right candidate for this job based on all of the things that you told me that you need. And so we've been successful with that. Is it a perfect science? No, because there's no such thing. But I do think that we are absolutely allowed to push on our hiring managers for legitimate feedback. Because that's our job. You don't want to be a yes person in recruiting. That doesn't help anybody. I've seen some really cool tech out there. I don't know if you guys are using it in the interview process of recording two-way interview, MetaView and some other products out there. Yeah. We're now I'm able to say to the hiring manager, Hey, I, I spoke with Stephanie. She's great. Check out this 30 second clip of her saying how she scaled it. Now you see it. You're yes. not just taking my word for it. What are you seeing as effective tools out there? Let's talk, let's talk tech. I love that. So yeah, we're actually, we're evaluating partnerships and, and relationships with tooling that is, that is just exactly as you've articulated. I think it's a huge gap. I think it's a big opportunity to, to invest. Secure. Here it is. Exactly. You're not taking my word. Here it is. Here's a candidate saying it. There's so much, though. One of the things that we've done internally that AI or, or a tool of that nature could support us with is interviews. If they're a 45-minute interview, I'm booking an hour with a hiring team because I need 15 minutes for you to do a scorecard. And, and that so scorecard action. You're building time action, in there so you have time to do it now and not right. tomorrow morning. But imagine if you had technology that could manage that for you. There's a lot of cool tech out there. There what, is what, cool what, tech. What, what, what's, uh, what's some of the cool stuff you're seeing that's really helping put the human back into human resources at TA. Yeah. 
So I think there's a lot of buzz about AI, AI this, AI that. I think for us and for me, I think when I look at AI, um, it needs to be something that is embedded within a product. AI should be like DNA. It's always running, it's always there, but you can't see it. It shouldn't be an extra step for my recruiter. It shouldn't be a fancy feature that you have to turn on to make it work. I think technology, when you think HR, I think technology and AI, that should be the resource, right? It should be the clear and finite, the science. Whereas the H is the human, and that is the that is the recruiter doing behavioral-based interviewing to validate skills. That is the extra touch in communication. That is all of the, the pieces and parts that make it a human-centric uh, process. Make it a tool and not a crutch. What's what's keeping you up at, the, up at night these days as a people business leader? Oh, gosh. Engagement. I think we're still in this really weird world of remote, hybrid, in-office, just across the board. We are a remote-first company. Engagement in a remote environment is something that it takes a lot of work. And How do you keep that up? Uh, it's a multi-tiered approach. This year, we, we run engagement surveys like every company, I'm sure, or many companies. But for us, we do action planning far different. We embed action planning within our business to really identify the key drivers of employee engagement because it's not the same in HR as it is in finance as it is in customers' organization. Right. And so we address each individual each individual group. And it's not a broad stroke for every it's not. department within a team. Otherwise, it fails. Like tech so, can be different than product versus... Yes. So we, we, run in, we run pulse surveys. So we did an engagement in April. We ran a pulse in August, and we saw anywhere from 20 to 50% positive increases in employee engagement across the questions. What is your, not just with your organization, your general philosophy to uh, work from home versus being in an office? I, I hear it takes, the uh, first guest that we had in earlier, he said, you have to be really careful that if we're pushing everybody to home, and the cost is going down that we might see a lot more outsourcing out of the country. I, like, I have not really thought that macro hmm. about it. That's an interesting perspective. I don't know that I would have connected those two dots. Yeah, it was a little bit of a, huh. Yeah, I, perhaps I would need somebody to help me thread that needle a little bit more. I'm not connecting Can we get the dots. same talent here that we get there? Where's the discrepancy? Yeah. I think it happened a lot with customer service about 10, 15 years ago. Yes. And somebody said, you know what? That was a mistake because we're losing customers because we're not getting the quality of service. Let's bring it back. Home. Yeah, I think I, it's entirely possible. That's not a strategy that we're evaluating. What puts a smile on your face every day when you go to work or turn on your computer? I, it's the positive reinforcement from our employees. I, it's so funny because I'm at HR Tech, so I'm running into our customers while I'm here. I had a customer attend a speaking session I did yesterday, and he stopped me in the expo hall and told me all about his implementation and how incredible his customer service and customer success reps were. And I just... That nothing makes me more proud than to hear our customers and our employees are having a positive experience with us. I just, honestly, I love it. I love it. <clears throat> so pro tip, you've been to a number of these events yeah. and in Vegas. What's a pro tip for anyone uh, going to any type of convention or work event in Las Vegas? Ooh, wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> uh, sensible footwear, I'm just kidding. But I would say keep an open mind. Go in, we have expo halls where there is any vendor that you can imagine is here. Go in knowing what it is that you're looking for and then have your success criteria mapped out in the back of your head. When you're talking to vendors, really start to ask some detailed questions so that when the outreach happens after the event, you have a more tailored uh, a perspective and opinion on who you want to have a conversation with. I love it. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Where could folks find you? Where could they connect? Where could they learn more about Employee? Yeah, absolutely. So we're on all the major platforms. Employeeinc.com is where you can find out about more about our products and you can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon. Jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.